Welcome to today's lecture on the Inguinal Canal, Part 1. My name is Carlos Andres suarez -Gian. I am the creator and narrator of this lecture. Let's begin. The objectives of this lecture are listed here. At the completion of this lecture, you should be able to describe the layers of the testis and scrotum as they relate to the anterior abdominal wall, name the palpable landmarks used to identify the inguinal ligament, describe the organization of the inguinal canal, including the superficial, external, and deep, internal inguinal rings, list the major contents of the inguinal canal in females and males, discuss the difference between indirect and direct inguinal hernias and their relationship to the inferior epigastric vessels and the deep ring. And finally, define the boundaries of the inguinal Hesselbach's triangle through which direct hernias pass. Let's start. Before getting into the substance of the lecture, let me just introduce the concept of the inguinal canal. These are listed here. The inguinal canals are short passages in the anterior abdominal wall that transmit the spermatic cord in the male or the round ligament in the female. They are located parallel to the distal one-third of the inguinal ligament's length for about four to six centimeters. The openings of the inguinal canal represent weaknesses in the anterior abdominal wall and because these weaknesses hernias can escape the abdominal cavity via the inguinal canal. Let me now demonstrate the location of the inguinal canal in the male on the left panel and the female on the right panel. Again as an introduction to the subject matter to follow. The cylinders represent the location of the inguinal canals and they reside deep to the aponeuroses that we discussed in the previous lecture. As mentioned previously, the termination of the inguinal canals are the superficial inguinal rings and in the male it is the spermatic cord that exits the ring whereas in the female it is the round ligament of the uterus. If you ask the question, why do we even need an inguinal canal? What's the big deal with it? These are the commonly stated reasons. Mammalian sperm cannot survive at body temperature, that is, 37 degrees centigrade. They're simply not viable. Indeed, some reproductive biologists have even posited that the constant use of computers in society has led to a diminished sperm concentration levels due to the increased temperature the testes are subjected to when we sit. I should emphasize that there are examples in mammals where the testes do not descend yet are viable, but this is more the topic for evolutionary biologists and embryologists. Thus, the testes must exit the body cavity and reside in a compartment that is compatible with sperm maturation, the scrotum. Transit of the testis from the internal body cavity to the scrotum is via the inguinal canal, formed by the aponeuroses of the lateral muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. Entry of the ductus deferens, a component of the spermatic duct, into the inguinal canal is via the deep inguinal ring and exit of the ductus deferens into the scrotum is via the superficial inguinal ring. We will discuss their formation in this lecture. The deep and superficial inguinal rings are weaknesses in the anterior abdominal wall and hernias or abdominal organ protrusions may extrude from these openings. Because hernias are relatively common, 
This is the reason that the inguinal canal and its openings have attracted so much interest from general surgeons. Finally, I should mention that women also have an inguinal canal, but the ovary is not required to migrate from the abdominal cavity into the labia majus to become fertile. In the female, as stated previously, the content of the inguinal canal is the round ligament of the uterus, a ligament that provides support to the uterus. To fully understand the migration of the testis and the formation of the inguinal canal in both the male and female entails some significant embryological description. This is not the place for it. However, this drawing can serve as a brief reminder. I'm showing you an image which represents a sagittal section through an embryo. Note the skin and the blue area representing the intraperitoneal space. The liver, stomach, colon, and small bowel develop within the intraperitoneal space and are called intraperitoneal organs. Additional organs may be found, the pancreas and the duodenum, but these are considered retroperitoneal organs. They develop and remain outside the peritoneal cavity. Both the testis and ovary, collectively called the gonads, also develop in the retroperitoneal space. It is from here that the testis must migrate to reach the scrotum, a process that begins around the seventh week after conception and ends at nine months. The gubernaculum testis, not shown in this image, is specifically involved in the migration of the testis. The ovary also migrates, but only to the pelvic cavity, and it becomes intraperitoneal. The gubernaculum in the female ultimately becomes the round ligament of the uterus. Failure to descend by the testis is associated with developing testicular cancer. During its transit to the scrotum, the testis will gain the layers of tissue it pushed through, although these are mostly the layers of the anterior abdominal wall, not the peritoneum membrane itself. The testis will slide behind the peritoneum until reaching the anterior abdominal wall. Again, this topic is discussed in embryology, not in gross anatomy. To describe it in a little bit more detail, the steps taken by the testis to descend, let me show you the sequence of events. Again, if you have had embryology, this should be a review. Also, it will help explain in the second half of this lecture how inguinal hernias form. First, let's label the relevant structures in a male fetus to gain an appropriate orientation. Similar homologous structures would be apparent in the female fetus. Here we see the penis, testis, peritoneum, gubernaculum testis, ductus deferens, and finally the inguinal canal. At three months, a processus vaginalis forms from the parietal peritoneum that extends anterior to the testis and proceeds to expand. By seven months, the testis has entered the inguinal canal, directed there by the gubernaculum testis. Note the processus vaginalis has continued the path of the testis into the inguinal canal. Finally, at nine months, the testis is fully descended into the scrotum and it is anchored there by the gubernaculum testis. Note the processus vaginalis anterior to the testis. The processus should pinch close at this time also. If it does not, consider the ease by which fluid, blood, or a piece of intestine 
could drift from the abdominal cavity into the scrotum. If it is a piece of bowel, it is known as an inguinal hernia. We will discuss this further in the next section. If it is fluid, it is known as a hydrocele. And if it is blood, the inclusion is known as a hematocele. If the hydrocele or the hematocele do not result on their own, they may lead to hernia development. Here's an example of how hydrocele presents in a child. The pen light examination reveals a clear or translucent scrotum distinct from the testis. This is the result of accumulation of fluid within the tunica vaginalis and it was likely caused by the infection or trauma. It is typically a local problem, that is, the fluid is constrained to the scrotum. Let's now look at the adult testis and associated structures to gain an appreciation of the path the testis took to reach the scrotum. Here, we find a cadaver on its back and the scrotum is visible. Presumably, you will find two testicles in the scrotum, one in its own compartment formed by the scrotal septum. The scrotum refers to the pouch that houses the testis. It is not the testis. Opening up the scrotum reveals the testis encased in its many layers acquired during its transit. As the testis punch through a layer of membrane, the membrane wraps around the testis and can be ultimately found enveloping the adult testis. Imagine pushing a finger into a balloon. This is what is happening to the testis, albeit the balloon is not popped. The wall of the scrotum consists of dartus muscle and colus fascia. The former acts to regulate the temperature of the testicle, which promotes spermatogenesis. It does this by expanding or contracting to winkle the scrotal skin. Colus fascia is considered to be the continuation of scarpus fascia. The gubernaculum, as mentioned briefly, is the key to directing and promoting testicular transit to the scrotum. Mice's genes for gubernaculum formation were knocked out are all born with cryptorchidism. In the adult, the gubernaculum anchors each testis to the scrotum. Finally, the spermatic cord can also be demonstrated. Cutting through the outermost layer of the testis and splaying the layers apart can provide a certain appreciation of the numerous layers the testis punch through. First, let's point to the testis proper and the spermatic cord. The sperm are produced in the testis and ultimately leave the testis by the spermatic cord. Prior to reaching the cord, however, they must pass through a tissue known as the epididymis, a long tube that is coiled on itself. Indeed, the sperm must pass through the epididymis, a period that can take as long as seven days to become fertile. At ejaculation, the sperm are propelled outwards from the epididymis, not the testis. But now, back to the layers covering the cords. The outermost layer is the external spermatic fascia, the membrane from the external oblique aponeurosis. If this layer is peeled away, we find the layer from the internal oblique muscle, the cremasteric muscle. This layer contains muscle fibers responsible for the cremasteric reflex. In men, if you rub the inner thigh, the testes are reflexively elevated on the same side by the cremasteric muscle on the control of the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. Women do not possess a cremasteric reflex. As you can imagine, many students have made light of the cremasteric reflex, but it is of significant clinical concern. 
absence of the reflex is considered to be diagnostic for testicular torsion. The cremasteric reflex has been reported to be absent in 100% of testicular torsion, making it potentially a useful sign in these diagnosis. In such a condition, the cord twists about itself and the blood supply to the testis is totally compromised. It is an extremely painful condition and if not resolved, the testis will undergo a vascular necrosis. The last layer we can discern in the image is the parietal layer of the tunica vaginalis. Go back to the first slide on testicular development and recall that the testis will glide underneath the peritoneum prior to powering through the layers of the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. The peritoneum layer will be added first to the cord and testis, followed by the layers of the muscles. On the left panel, the spermatic cord has now been opened, exposing ductus deferens. Looking at the testis and epididymis, the sections of the epididymis can now be discerned. They include the head of the epididymis, the body of the epididymis, and the tail of the epididymis. Understand that the ductus deferens is contiguous with the tail of the epididymis. At ejaculation, sperm capable of fertilizing the egg depart from the tail of the epididymis. A vasectomy, as the name implies, entails the blockage of the ductus deferens to inhibit the passage of sperm from the tail of the epididymis and be ejaculated. The ductus deferens is cut prior to entering the superficial ring on both sides and the procedure is considered permanent. Reports are present in the literature, however, where reversal have been successful. Of course, this requires that the testis remain viable after the vasectomy, even after many years, not always a given. Moving now to the panel on the right, the testis and epididymis are again labeled, and now, the structures within the spermatic cord become more visible. The ductus deferens is again pointed out, as well as the testicular artery, the sole artery that serves the testis. This may give you an idea why testicular torsion can lead to such insidious consequences. The torsion acts as a tourniquet on the sole arterial supply for the testis that can be cut off during torsion. Finally, I mentioned the veins of the testis and these form a plexus, the pampiniform plexus of veins. This plexus functions as a system of cooling fluid surrounding the testicular artery to cool down arterial blood before it enters the testis. Under certain conditions, however, venous drainage can be impaired and the veins become varicose. This condition is known as a varicocele, and it feels in men who have such conditions as containing a back of worms. Varicoceles are associated with a higher rate of infertility in men who have them. You have listened to a lot of information on layers of the anterior abdominal wall, and in this lecture on the migration of the testis, and the layers of the spermatic cord. Before continuing, let's review. Here, I show you a coronal section through the anterior abdominal wall at the level of the testis. The drawing is made of a section taken through the body as indicated by the blue square. For orientation, note the location of the inferior epigastric artery. Regarding the anterior abdominal wall, recall that we start with skin, then in the superficial fascia, we have two layers, a fatty campers and a membranous scarpus. Deep to scarpus at this location, 
the external bleak avenue roses was present, deep to which was the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis muscle. Next, we encountered another layer of fascia, the fascia transversalis, followed by extraperitoneal fat, and finally, the peritoneum. The testis punched through all the layers of the anterior abdominal wall to reach the scrotum, except for the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle and glided deep to the peritoneum. Looking now at the covering to the cord, the continuation of the external oblique aponeurosis is evident as the external spermatic fascia, and the internal oblique gives all the cremaster muscle. The last layer is the internal spermatic fascia that was derived from the fascia transversalis. Within the cord itself, extraperineal fat and peritoneum have been dragged down. Moving to the testis, the skin is clearly continuous and as described earlier, campers fascia becomes contiguous with darter's muscle, as does scarpus fascia with coli's fascia. Surrounding the testis is the tunica vaginalis, the continuation of the peritoneum. Remember, the testis does not punch through the peritoneum, but the peritoneum does extend into the scrotum as a pouch, and the pouch is generally sealed at birth. If it is not, inguinal hernias will be the result. We will discuss this further later. The last layer to surround the testis is the fibrous layer known as the tunica albuginea. Finally, you may have heard the urban legend that sumo wrestlers are able to elevate their testis prior to a fight. This is not true. While in theory, it may be possible to do this via muscles of the pelvic floor or acquire control over the cremaster muscle, it is not practiced by sumo wrestlers today, and sumo does not allow contact with this region. The legend may have been started by Ian Fleming, the author of James Bond, in his novel, You Only Live Twice. This now concludes the first part of this video on the inguinal canal.